Yeah. Uh, three bows to the Buddha. Bow to the teacher. Okay, everyone. So we meet again. <laughs> and it's a uh, good morning from Sydney and uh, good evening to you all in the USA and um, wherever you are joining in from the world. So how have you all been over the last year? We haven't seen each other for a year now. Uh, I hope that Excuse me. I hope that you're all doing well, um, particularly with the current situation in, in the world at the moment. Um, we're still dealing with COVID and we've got quite a few conflicts and natural disasters that have already begun as well. So when I think about this, you know, we're actually very fortunate to be able to, to sit in our lounge rooms or in our bedrooms, wherever you are and to, to listen to the Dharma at this very moment and not have to worry about, you know, conflicts outside and so forth. So we should all reflect on actually how fortunate we are and think about uh, how we can practice further. Now, I hope that over the next four days, uh, the Dharma provided in this retreat by all the presenters can help you all bring more happiness to your life and to guide you towards that direction as well. So this year, my talk will be on taking refuge in the Triple Gem. And for most people, you might think, oh, this is so basic. Didn't, didn't I do this already? Um, it may be basic to some people, but it's actually a very important aspect for all Buddhists to understand. Now, taking refuge actually has both the theoretical and principal aspects behind it, as well as the practical aspects of the ceremony, our behaviours and so forth, after we take refuge. Now, I remember when I first encountered Buddhism, you know, and I heard someone ask me, do you want to take refuge? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, huh? how did they know I was a refugee? Because I um, my family escaped from Vietnam uh, after the war. And I'm thinking, but I've already found refuge in Australia. Why do I need to take refuge again? <laughs> but after being asked a few times, I decided to then ask the Venerable, what are these people talking about? So if you look up the dictionary, you know, the word refuge has the meaning of to be in a safe situation protected from danger. So in Buddhism, finding a place of refuge is to find that thing or that place which we can turn to for help when in times of need. And if you think about it, this is just like having a close friend or family member that you know you can always rely on when you need help and support. Now, for some people who are not so religious, when they're upset and sad, they may turn to retail therapy to find that happiness again. Now, others may choose a cheaper option and just simply retreat to nature. But in life, there are situations where shopping and even friends and close family members cannot really help us. When we start to actually search for the meaning of life in earnest and start to think about the whole process of our lives, you will start to realise the importance of spiritual practice. For those only starting their search and also those who have begun looking and been looking for a while, I hope that the material presented over these next few days will help you to logically and rationally analyse things so you can find a place of refuge for yourself. And for those who have already begun their practice and already taken refuge in the Triple Gem, 
I hope that this material can help you to affirm and strengthen your resolve to follow the Triple Gem. Now, the material for this talk is predominantly from Venerable Ingsun's book, The Way to Buddhahood. And the importance of taking refuge is reflected in the fact that the very start of this book, the very first chapter, is titled Taking Refuge in the Triple Gem. So this chapter explains in detail the reasons why the Triple Gem is the ultimate and only place of true refuge. But remember that taking refuge is not merely about having faith in the Triple Gem or it's not simply about going through the ceremony. Just as important, and if not more so, Venerable Ing Sun teaches us what it truly means to take refuge. And this includes how we should transform ourselves, transform our behaviours and ways of thinking for the better. So over these next four lessons, uh, the general outline of what I'll be discussing is to first go through some background material and then we'll talk about why take refuge in the Triple Gem. And in this area, we'll also look at some of the worldly temptations and some of the other realms that people may decide to turn to. And then we'll go through the true place of refuge and this is where we look at the Buddha gem, the Dharma gem, and the Sangha gem in much more detail. Next, we will then discuss the issue of the worldly and the transcendental triple gem. And last, we'll look at the act of taking refuge and what it includes. <coughs> so first, some background material. Now, when we talk about learning and practicing Buddhism, this is to learn from the Buddha. So it means that we want to learn from the Buddha. We take the Buddha as our ideal goal and role model. And we aim to continually learn from the Buddha until we become equal with the Buddha. And that is when we also attain Buddhahood. Now, some people will think, why should I become a Buddha? Why should I aspire to becoming a Buddha? The reason being is that a Buddha is a being with great awakening. That is, they have perfect wisdom, great compassion, and perfect virtues. So in this sense, they are the ultimate sage. The perfection of Buddhahood is indeed not an easy feat to accomplish especially when we think about starting this cultivation from the state of an ordinary being with few merits, not much wisdom and plenty of afflictions and bad habits. But we have to start somewhere. Otherwise, we'll actually get nowhere and we'll just be stuck in cyclic existence. So to embark on this path of cultivation, we must learn the necessary practices and apply them in our daily lives. And only by following the right path to Buddhahood can we actually achieve the goal of Buddhahood. So what this means is that if we have the right path, if we learn properly, then we can progress from our current position as an ordinary being to the final goal of becoming a Buddha. And one thing in this process is we should not think about how long will it take or how much we have to learn and how much we have to do, how much we have to practice. So instead of complaining in, you know, like a little kid sitting at the back of the car, are we there yet, are we there yet, we should take things a step at a time. Just like when you start school at kindy and then you move on each year as your knowledge and your skills base grow. So as you practice from the entry-level teachings, as your cultivation develops, you will naturally be able to pick up the more advanced practices. And then it will all be a matter of time before you reach the final goal. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so when we say the way to Buddhahood, 
This is referring to the right path that can lead us to that destination of Buddhahood. Now, as the saying goes, many roads lead to Rome. And so within the Buddha Dharma, there are various paths to cater to beings of different spiritual capacity and at different stages of cultivation. Now, these paths can include things such as the path of virtues and merits, the path of wisdom, the path of difficult practices, the path of easy practices, the worldly path, the transcendental path, the Shravaka path, the Bodhisattva path, and so forth. Now, although the Buddhist teachings present many forms of practices, and so you have a plethora of paths to take, in the absolute sense, there is only one path. And all these paths are practices that lead to Buddhahood. Hence, there is only <coughs> Hence, there is actually only one way to Buddhahood. And in other words, what this means is all these paths and practices aim to do the following. So they aim to cause sentient beings to aspire towards the wisdom and insight of the Buddhas. And they aim to manifest the wisdom and insight of the Buddhas to sentient beings. They aim to cause sentient beings to awaken to the wisdom and insight of the Buddhas. And they aim to cause sentient beings to embark on the path of the wisdom and insight of the Buddhas. So these four aspects are quite common. Um, they've kind of become an idiom in Chinese. And um, why does it keep jumping like this? So for those who can read both Chinese and English, um, most of the times you'll only hear the words, the first words, kai shi wu ru, um, but the actual meaning of these four aspects are explained in more detail in the English. And because all these paths aim for the one goal, in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, and in particular what we're referring to is the Mahayana version of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it says that there is only one path, one purity, one flavour, and one liberation. And similarly, in the Shurangama Sutra, it says there are many expedient paths, but they return to the one single path and no other. So this is likened to any great river system, whether it is the Yangtze River, the Yellow River. Um, there are many... <coughs> if you think about a, a large river system, from its original headwaters until it reaches the ocean. There are many streams, lakes, and smaller river systems whose water will converge with this greater river. And together, the whole body of water flows towards the ocean. So in the same way, all these different Dharma practices that we encounter flow through to Buddhahood. So if we practice um, different methods, we should always remember that ultimately they lead to the one path. And that's why you see this in the Agama Sutras and the Lotus Sutra. It describes the Buddha Dharma as the path of the one vehicle. Now, when we look at the Triple Gem, we need to understand that it is the fundamental basis or the foundation of the Buddha Dharma. And taking refuge in the Triple Gem is the entryway or the door to access the Buddha Dharma. The virtues and merits of the Triple Gem are countless and boundless, so much so that it is unfathomable. Now, if one does not take refuge in the Triple Gem, then they are unable to gain these benefits and make use of these virtues and merits properly and fully. Now, this is like one who is outside the doors of Disneyland. And so one has yet to really enjoy all of what Disneyland has to offer. 
Therefore, when we aspire to learn the Buddha Dharma, it is important that we take refuge in the Triple Gem. So this does not mean that for anyone wanting to learn Buddhism, we have to make them take refuge first. This is not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is after you have decided to become a Buddhist and you've learned the Buddha Dharma for quite a while, and if you're very serious about practicing the path and the cultivation, then it is imperative for you to take refuge. Now, in terms of my own experience, I didn't take refuge until quite a few years after I was introduced to Buddhism. And at first, my attitude was, I don't need it. I was really sceptical, actually. So I was just trying to protect myself from being stuck in some cult. But after joining uh, the particular temple I went to and going every weekend, um, I was actually quite active in their uh, the youth committee, helping out with a lot of activities. But each time they had the ceremony and someone would say, do you want to register to take refuge? I would, without hesitation, I would say, no, thank you. Um, I'm fine the way I am. But with hindsight now, I understand that it was my lack of confidence in the Triple Gem and my lack of understanding in the meaning of the Triple Gem that created such an obstacle. But once I've actually decided to take refuge, it was like finding a long lost family member that really, really cared about me. And it allowed my practice to develop in ways that um, I never really thought about. So I became much more motivated to learn and practice. And the learning part and the practice part somehow just seemed to be much easier. So Buddhism is a religion and there are spiritual experiences, personal experiences that each person will be able to um, experience for themselves. And when we take refuge and we make that commitment, for me, that experience was I found a new source of energy and motivation. So this here, um, I'd like to remind everyone that the mindset and the attitude we have when we take refuge will impact how much benefit you get from taking refuge. So if you have taken refuge without sincere motives and um, the most likely situation here is, you know, if you were a child and your parents brought you along and said, undergo the ceremony. So in a, in a sense, you were forced to do it. And so most likely you would have done the ceremony to take refuge without much thought. So in such a situation, your motivation and your mindset is probably not so ideal. But no need to fret about that because now that you've started to learn the Buddha Dharma and you're practicing the Buddha Dharma, your practice will help to strengthen your motivation to take refuge. And so you need not worry if you were one of those who were fortunate enough to be born into a Buddhist family and have taken refuge at a young age. Now, for most people, when they're searching for their spiritual place of refuge, they'll go through similar experiences. And hence, in Chapter 1, Venerable Ing Sun begins by explaining the search for a spiritual place of refuge. And this is summarised in the verse where he says, The ocean of existence has no bounds. This world is full of worries and suffering. Cyclic existence has its ups and downs. Where can one truly take refuge? So when one decides that they need a spiritual place of refuge, then often you will have a very sincere and strong motivation to look for that place. Now, this sincerity is likened to a person lost at sea who is at the mercy of the waves and looking all around them is just water. So in this scenario, the person is caught in a life or death situation, and when they come across floating debris and so forth, they will try and grab at it. 
and they'll start to yearn for help and they'll earnestly want to see someone or something that can come and help them and save them. And at this point in time, if a boat actually approaches and throws out a lifeline, then if you were that person, of course, you would immediately grab hold of that lifeline and try to board the boat. So when seeking refuge in the Triple Gem, one's sincerity and intention should be just like this person lost at sea, yearning to be rescued. Only with such intentions can one properly accomplish the virtues of taking refuge in the Triple Gem. And note here the words, accomplish the virtue of taking refuge. Taking refuge is not just a spur of the moment thing or something decided upon carelessly. To truly take refuge, one has to exert effort to develop their right understanding and hence develop confidence in the triple gem. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, if we go to the simile of being tossed about in the ocean of suffering, then we can elaborate on the issue of taking refuge. So sentient beings make up the foundation of this world. And what this means is that beings with consciousness and a lifespan are the reality of existence in this world that we know about. And hence in the Buddhist text, sentient beings is also referred to as existences. And when we look at the past of each being, we have existed one life after another since time without beginning. And going forward, until we gain liberation from cyclic existence, we will go through one life again and again. So this cycle from life to life continues without any bounds. And this is our existence which is just like being caught in the vast ocean and seeing no end in sight. In our present life, it's really no more than the crest of a wave in this vast ocean of life and death. So from the past to the present and from the present into the future, life after life, over the passage of time, what is created is also called this world. And sentient beings in this world endure more suffering compared to joy. Once the happiness we experience ends, suffering will definitely ensue. So this world is really full of vexations and suffering. And in the Samyukta Agama Sutra 283, the Buddha describes our existence as worries, sorrows, vexations, suffering, a pure mass of suffering. Now, our, our existence in this world that we create is full of worries and sufferings. And as we cycle from one life to the next, at times we can progress and we are born in the heavenly or the human realms and enjoy a relatively good life. Then at other times we regress and are born into the hells, the animal or the hungry ghost realms which collectively are called the three evil destinies because the life that we experience in these realms is very miserable. Now, this means after we progress, we can regress, and after regressing, we can progress again. So in this way, we move up and down in the ocean of cyclic existence without any way to escape this roller coaster. So if you think about it in this sense, it's actually quite pitiful and sad and painful form of existence that we are enduring. And when humans are lost at sea and at the mercy of nature, we know to seek rescue. We yearn to seek rescue. But in contrast, sentient beings are lost in the ocean of cyclic existence and we've been suffering for a long time. But we still don't seem to understand and we still don't seem to really seek rescue or to aim for liberation and true freedom. Only when we ponder about existence deeply and properly, then the intention and urgency to seek refuge and rescue will begin to arise. 
But of course, this all is based on the premise that one accepts that our existence is cyclical. Understanding this cycle of life and death is imperative to motivating us to seek refuge. And once we begin looking for a place <coughs> of refuge, the next question becomes, where can we take refuge? And in other words, it means who or what can we truly rely on? And in these following verses, Venerable Ingsun begins to look at worldly places of refuge that people may turn to and dispel them one by one. Accumulated wealth will all be dispersed. After achieving great heights, one must decline. All gatherings end in separation. Where there is birth, there will be death. A peaceful nation can become unstable. This external world forms and decays. Of all the types of joy in this world, none can be a place of refuge. So in terms of people in this world, there are two main groups. One group are those who do not even know to seek refuge. And the other group are those who do want to seek a place of refuge. Among the second group, unfortunately, some have ended up following evil leaders and cults. <coughs> so, but when we look back to the first group who do not even look for a place of refuge, we need to think about why is this so? And generally it's because in their hearts or minds, they're unaware they're insensitive to the situation of cyclic existence and their eyes are blinded by worldly affairs. So to, for these people, they think that there's much meaning and joy in worldly life. But sadly, as death approaches and they finally wake up from this mesmerising dream, sorrow and despair can arise, but by that time it's all too late. Now, there are many things in this world that can delude us and mesmerise people, but the main ones can be grouped into the following six types. First is the accumulation of wealth, then the extensions to high ranks, gatherings with those we care about, longevity, a nation's property, uh, prosperity, and advancement of civilization. Now, even for people like us who have found refuge in the Triple Gem, we need to be mindful of these worldly temptations because throughout our lives and our practice, there will be times when our minds can get carried away with these worldly affairs as well. So we must be aware to develop awareness and mindfulness so that we don't get lost in worldly affairs. Now, the first worldly temptation is the accumulation of wealth. And this is especially applicable to householders practicing Buddhism. Financial stability is important. And there is the Chinese saying, money is not everything, but one can't live without it. But for some people, financial security is regarded as the most important thing. And such people tend to to devote their lives to accumulating wealth. And as long as they have money, they think all problems can be solved. Now, there is even the saying, with money, one can even order ghosts to work for them. But no matter how much wealth we can accumulate in this life, that fortune will one day disperse into nothing. Now, this is not to say that we can't manage our wealth properly. What we're saying is, as an individual, we actually don't have total control over our wealth. The Buddha taught us that wealth is shared among five families. And this is when we meet with heavy floods, large fires, thieves, evil or greedy rulers. And if we have spendthrift children, then our wealth can easily be exhausted in the blink of an eye by these five family members. Now, over the course of accumulating wealth, the management and preservation of that wealth can also lead to many worries and sufferings. 
and at times the wealth itself can become a source of many hardships. So, for example, at the end of the Ming Dynasty, Li Chuang invaded Beijing and used various torture methods on the ministers and government officials to extract their wealth from them. In the end, a lot of these government officials lost all of their wealth and were badly injured. Some even died because of this torture. So this is an actual example of dispersion of wealth when one meets with thieves and evil rulers. Now, wealth itself can cause much worry and suffering, and we really have no foolproof way to preserve it. As a practicing Buddhist, it is fine to work hard and earn a good living, and it is certainly fine to enjoy your wealth. But just be aware and guard against becoming a slave to wealth, which will then gradually draw you away from your practice. Next is ascensions to high ranks. So gaining positions of power and status is something that many dream about and think about. People who are in a high position or if they hold the reins, they think they can achieve whatever they desire and generally possess the demeanour of everything is at my disposal. Nonetheless, from a high-ranked position, one will eventually have to decline. Now, in modern history, there is the poignant and infamous examples of Hitler and his rise to power. However, on the eve of Berlin's fall, he was left with no other choice but to commit suicide. And there is also the example of Stalin, who was able to rule over Russia for 30 years and although he seemed to have controlled all the wealth in that country, after he died, it was completely plundered by the people in his own ruling party. In the Buddhist scriptures, there are also examples, and one is of the heavenly king, Mudagata. He ruled over the four continents, and King Mudagata was born in the Triatrimsa heaven and shared the throne with Chakra. In spite of having all this power towards the end of his heavenly life, he was actually destined to regress in his next life, and this brought him much vexations. So this heavenly ruler, who claims that he is the king of heaven and earth, was not able to avoid his future destiny of being reborn as a donkey. So in summary, Chasing after positions of power will not bring you lasting happiness. And positions of power also applies to fame. If you look at the entertainment industry, movie stars and singers come and go quite quickly. And sports stars have an even shorter professional life. And then who actually remembers these people once they fall out of the limelight? And once they're no longer newsworthy, all that prestige that comes with that fame will disappear as well. <coughs> the third aspect that can draw us away from our practice is gatherings with those we care about. Humans are social beings and we can develop strong relationships with others. So often we do long for the warmth of a family unit to be with people that we care about, that make us happy. And in addition, when we're at school, when we're working in society, we can also start to develop and create new connections with friends and colleagues. Now, humans have this ability to cooperate with those we care about. And having such connections do bring much joy and comfort. However, at times, close friends and relatives can turn into enemies. But we will put that aside for now. No matter how close we are with other people, eventually we will have to separate from them. And when the time comes for the living to part with the deceased, the relationships that we have with people, our relatives, our friends, our spouses, our children, and so forth, 
all of this has to be abandoned. Alone and frightened, the dying must continue to move on. We actually have no choice or control. We flow with our karma. And at this point, who is it that we can really rely on? Fourth is the aspect of longevity. Now, throughout history and in the various cultures, there are stories of kings, emperors, and rulers all searching for the elixir of life or the fountain of youth. Real-life experience tells us that where there is birth, there will be death. And as the saying goes, there are only two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. The occurrence of death is actually evidenced everywhere in our daily life. But we humans tend to live our lives as if we will not die. Now, it seems that only with existence and some sort of longevity that there is meaning to life. You know, without it, why do we work so hard for fame and fortune? Why do we try to possess so many things? It's because we want to live forever. Now, even though some people may talk about dying and prepare for it with wills and funeral insurance, but often we do live our life as if it won't happen to me. And there's a Chinese saying that humans live for around 100 years and yet we have the worries of a 1,000 years. This saying reveals the ignorance concerning death, which leads to many incorrect ideologies about some eternal life. Now, there is also the trend where in our youth we have vitality and we use that to chase after fame and fortune at the cost of our health. Then, as we grow old, we end up using up all of that accumulated wealth to try and reclaim that health. Now, this clearly indicates that we have an inverted view about life and death. Fifth is a nation's prosperity. And it is true that our nation or our country can be regarded as one of our greatest protector that provides us with safety. There is a close relationship between the prosperity and strength of the nation and the people's happiness, security, safety and freedom. Now, due to this relationship, some people think that as long as the country is strong and dominant, then the people will have security and happiness. However, a country's strength does not necessarily equate to the happiness of each and every individual or their family unit. Now, where a country is strong and society is stable, the rise and fall of the governing parties in a country is not purely measured by the degree of their patriotism. And therefore, when a party that is very patriotic loses its governing power, the people in that party will be very unhappy. And you can think back to your own elections to see examples of this. So it's certainly not the case that the people in a strong country with a stable society are all happy. Moreover, each nation is continually caught in a cycle of stability and then disorder. So this means that after a period of good governance and stability, eventually things will change course into disorder and instability. Now, when a country becomes disordered and unstable, the people will definitely endure suffering. This fact cannot be refuted when we look at the history of all the countries around the world. Therefore, relying on our nation to be the place of lasting refuge is not correct and not entirely secure. Now, the sixth is advancement of civilization. So some people regard human civilization as being quite important because humans are civilized beings. Now for such people, 
it seems that the true meaning of human existence lies in the advancement of culture and our civilization. So accordingly, they see no need to focus on their own predicament and hence they do not know to seek refuge spiritually. Such as, to have such an attitude is actually to be biased in their view. And in this way, they tend to focus on the collective group and ignore the individual. But even if we assume that the meaning of human existence is to advance culture and civilization, we need to reflect that the activities of society depend on the world we live in. That means we are dependent on this earth on which we live. And we cannot depart from this physical location. But even if we can migrate to Mars or the moon, even if we move to a different world system, the same principle will apply. This physical world is also in a cyclical state of formation and then decay. So after its decay, there will be another formation. So if we think about this carefully, what is the true meaning of human existence once our earth enters destruction and decay? So in summary, some people are unable to initiate the motivation to move or to seek refuge because they are disillusioned by the temporary meaning of human existence that lies before them. Now, when these people are in the world and they carry out all these worldly matters that bring them temporary happiness, they can develop a misconception about the meaning of human existence. The sutras clearly explain the situation of human existence and prove that all these things that mesmerize people cannot be relied upon as a lasting and true place of refuge. The reason being is that all of these things are neither permanent nor truly joyful. So then what is the true thing or the true place we can take refuge in? After one decides to seek a place of refuge, unfortunately, some are misled by erroneous practices and evil cults. Now, although people generally do not understand or have an awareness about the role of their chosen object of refuge, they will be influenced by this chosen object. And therefore, it is critical that we exercise care when we choose our object, our place of refuge, because the chosen object is not only something that we must be able to rely on, it should also be something that we take as our role model and that we seek to emulate and become. So in this world, the beliefs and religions that people can take refuge in are many and varied. And here, Venerable Ing Sun covers the three major categories and from their shortcomings, it will be clear that they too are not places of refuge. So ghosts and spirits delight in violence. Devas of the desire heaven indulge in desires. The individual Brahma Deva is self-absorbed. None of these realms are places of refuge. So first we look at the spirit realm. According to traditional Chinese beliefs, there are heavenly deities, earthly spirits, and humans become spirits once they die. For humans who have accumulated many virtues and merits, they can become deities too. And there are many kinds of deities and spirits, such as the wind deities, the rain deities, the mountains, water, earth, grain deities, and so forth. Although Venerable Ing, Sun dis Venerable Ing Sun's discussion is based on the Chinese culture, the concept of having multiple devas and gods and spirits with control over various natural elements and phenomena are actually quite common among the different cultures. Now, this category of the spirit realm also includes the spirits and deities mentioned in other religions, such as the demons and the devils, 
ghosts, souls, angels, and so forth. The spirit and deities, spirits and deities do possess some virtues and supernatural powers, and some are inclined to wholesomeness and provide service to the higher levels of heavens. According to the Buddhist scriptures, ghosts refers to the beings in the hungry ghost realm, and deities refers to the beings in the realms ruled by the four heavenly kings. So deities also includes the yakshas, the rakshas, the nagas, the maharagas, and the garudas, as well as the mighty ghost spirits and the advanced spiritual animals. And here, advanced spiritual animals refer to animals that are beyond the worldly type that we encounter. So they're a bit like the mythical animals that we will read about in various cultures and religions. Under certain circumstances, such spirits and deities are able to assist humans and so humans reciprocate with veneration and offerings. Now, this kind of assistance that humans seek from spirits can include requesting blessings of fortune or removing evil forces and influences and simply asking the spirits and deities to leave them alone and not harm them. But despite having such powers, the spirits and deities are still strongly influenced by their own defilements and afflictions. And for some, their morality and ethics do not even stand up to human morality and ethics. Now, this is especially true for those spirits and deities that have developed a strong habit of hatred and become preoccupied with violence and harming others. Often with these type of deities, we see that they can demand from humans who seek their help they will demand sacrificial offerings of blood and even some form of life. And in these situations, if that person does not respectfully make those offerings, then these evil spirits and deities will often use many cruel ways to harm the person. So if you accidentally offend these types of spirits, they can take revenge on you in many harmful ways. So such violent spirits and deities are akin to the gangsters and criminal syndicates in society. Now, some of these people, when you face difficulties, they may help you and you may see them donate generously to charity. But if you offend these criminals and gangsters, they can entrap you in a web of violence. So an example that Venerable Ying Sun told us about was Venerable Da Yong. Now this Venerable uh, was in Beiping in China and he wanted to travel to Tibet to learn the esoteric Buddhist school's teachings. And according to the rules of the esoteric school, learners have to seek a protector deity. And it is said that Venerable Da Yong sought the fox spirit from a particular temple to be his protector deity. However, it turned out that this fox spirit was opposed to Venerable Da Yong's plan to travel to Tibet. And if the Venerable insisted on going, the fox spirit would create many obstacles and trouble for the Venerable. There is a common saying in Chinese, inviting the spirits is easy but requesting them to leave is difficult. And it was only after expending enormous amounts of effort that Venerable Da Yong was able to drive away this fox spirit. So those who tend to worship such spirits and deities can end up in situations where their family is destroyed and they themselves are harmed. So why would anyone get themselves into such a situation? Now, Confucius is a wise person and he often teaches us that we should respect the spirits but keep them at a distance. And this is certainly a good approach to dealing with spirits and deities. 
<coughs> so here is a diagram of the Buddhist cosmology. And when we talk about the spirits and the deities, they are at the bottom section where we see the hungry ghost realm and the heaven of the four kings. Now, above the spirit realm, there is the desire heavens. And the word desire here refers to the five desires of the material world concerning subtle forms, sounds, aromas, flavours and sensations, as well as the desire for intimacy between partners. Heaven here has the meaning of bright and luminous and refers to the common understanding of heaven in the various religions. Within the three realms of the Buddhist cosmology, the desire plane or the desire realm has a total of six heavens. Now the lowest of these six heavens is the heaven of the four heavenly kings. And this includes the eight legions of spirits. Next in ascending order is the Triatrimsa heaven, which is also called the 33 heaven. Then there is the Yama heaven, the Tushita heaven, the Nimanaratas heaven, which means enjoying the conjured. And above that, there is the heaven of freely enjoying things conjured by others. So beings in these six heavens all have desire for material enjoyment and intimacy. Therefore, they are collectively called the desire heavens. And among these desire heavens, the deity that has the most interaction with humans is Chakra, the ruler of the Triatrimsa heaven. Now, when we compare the beings in the spirit realm with those in the desire heavens, naturally, the latter is more refined. That means the heavenly beings are more refined. The main shortcoming, however, of beings in the desire heavens is that they indulge in matters that fulfill their desires. So while enjoying their material pleasures, these beings tend to live an extravagant and indolent lifestyle. And as a result, their spiritual practice to develop wisdom and virtues begin to regress. Now, at one time, Chakra invited the Buddha to give a Dharma teaching, but pretty much after he returned to his heaven, he had already forgotten what the Buddha had said. And there are many stories about heavenly beings coming to listen to the Dharma and then forgetting it once they return to their heavenly homes. Desire is a source of suffering, and such heavens where one indulges in material pleasures while regressing in spiritual development means that one cannot save themselves. So such heavenly realms are not conducive to spiritual practice, and that is why we can't rely on these places as our refuge. So this means if we seek rebirth in these upper levels of existences, we may enjoy the heavenly pleasures, but it all comes at the cost of our spiritual practice. Now, above the desire realm or the desire plane, we have the form realm or the form plane. And in the, plane, in the form plane, there are four levels based on meditative concentration or jhanas. And the first jhana heaven has three levels of Brahma heavens. Beyond the Brahma heavens, there are the second, third and fourth jhana heavens. And above that, there is the formless plane or the formless realm. However, the beings in these higher levels of heaven virtually have no interaction with humans. The existence of these high levels of heavens is only accepted by a small number of beliefs and so have not formed part of the mainstream religious beliefs that we have in our world today. And for this reason, Venerable Ing Sun does not elaborate further on these higher levels of heavens. But one thing to note is that if you want to gain rebirth in the form and the formless planes, 
one requires the cultivation of deep meditative concentration as a primary cause. Now, the beings in these other heavens, particularly the first jhana heaven, there are three Brahma heavens in here. And the Brahma Parasatya heaven is like ordinary beings. So the beings, um, the beings in this first level are like the citizens, while the next level up is the Brahma Purahita heaven, and here the beings are a bit like government officials. The very top, the third, is the Maha Brahma heaven, and here there is only one being, and he is like the king. And so this heaven is also referred to as the solitary or the individual Brahma heaven. Now, these Brahma heavens are quite pure, and the beings here have no lust or craving for worldly material pleasures. The virtues and compassion, their universal love, the beings that the beings in these Brahma heavens possess these very lofty virtues. And among the, re the religions of the world, these beings are considered as their founders or saints. Now, according to the Buddhist scriptures, when Mahabrahma, when the Mahabrahma heaven first appeared, and there were no officials or citizens, because the lower levels of the Brahma heavens had not formed yet. In addition, during this time, the desire plane including places like our earth, had not formed. But it was coincidental that when Mahabrahma had the thought of having places like heaven and earth, the desire realm had begun to gradually form. And when Mahabrahma had thought about beings and existences of sentient beings, it was also coincidental that at this time, humans started to appear on earth. Now, because Mahabrahma himself still has ignorance and is self-absorbed, unavoidably, unavoidably, he developed the misunderstanding that the heaven and earth and all beings were created by him. Now, Mahabrahma's lifespan is said to be one and a half eons long. So he also mistakenly declared that he was eternal and permanent. Now, the Mahabrahma in Indian religion is parallel to God in Christianity. And Mahabrahma's holy practice of taming worldly desires and his spirit of compassion and love fundamentally are praiseworthy. However, due to his ignorance, he can also exhibit the affliction where those who follow him shall live, while those who do not will perish. So general worldly religions all fall within the scope of having spirits and gods or a pantheon of gods with a dominant ruler or having just one supreme creator. All these heavenly beings discussed above still have defilements and are caught in the cycle of life and death. They themselves are beings with defilement and have no means to liberate themselves. And so the verse says, None of these realms are places of refuge. Now, when someone comes to terms with the suffering of cyclic existence, they will begin to look for a spiritual place of refuge. The search for a spiritual path can take one to the ends of the earth and the ten directions of the universe. If one systematically and rationally analyzes the various options we have, eventually we can confirm for ourselves that the spirits and gods, the great rulers of the spirit realms and the creator gods are all not true places of refuge. Finally, one should be able to realize that the ultimate and true place of refuge can only be found in the triple gem. The Buddha, Dharma and Sangha make up the triple gem and all three are precious, they are hard to come by 
they are invaluable and their wondrous functions are unequaled. Hence, we call them gems. For those of you who have started to search for your spiritual path in this life, this process may be more familiar. For some people, due to their past wholesome karma, they are born into a Buddhist family and accept the path readily. If you have read Venerable Ingsun's biography, you will see that his search for his spiritual path took him through years of studying and practicing various religions before he settled on Buddhism. When we take refuge in the Triple Gem, this can help us to turn misfortune into fortune, change hardships into opportunities, turn over a new leaf and give up bad habits and become wholesome. It can bring light where there is darkness and help us leave behind pain and suffering and find peace and happiness. All these auspicious events can come true and so the triple gem is described as being most auspicious. So the verse says, searching everywhere for the place of refuge, searching tirelessly throughout the ten directions. The ultimate place of refuge is the triple gem, which is most auspicious. So there is nothing more valuable than taking refuge and the only true place of refuge is the triple gem. Now this is not a statement of self-praise while belittling other spiritual practices. Rather, this is a conclusion gained from the dual aspects of objective analyses and the facts. So the fact is that not long after Gautama or Prince Siddhartha became the Sakyamuni Buddha, Mahabrahma, the creator deity and the ruler of the Brahma heavens, came down to request the Buddha to teach the Dharma. Mahabrahma felt that he himself had no other means to teach and save his own children. So remember, he thinks that sentient beings, particularly humans, are his children and creation. The Buddha kindly agreed to his request and began to expound the Dharma. And this is also referred to as turning the Dharma wheel. Now, the aim of teaching the Dharma or turning the Dharma wheel is to help sentient beings, especially humans, to gain liberation from suffering. Mahabrahma himself became the Buddha's disciple. In addition, in the Buddha's past lives, when he was still a bodhisattva, there was a time when Chakra's heavenly lifespan was coming to an end. Now, what was troubling Chakra was that in his next life, he was destined to be born as a pig. Now, this caused Chakra much anxiety, and he started to look for a solution. He sought advice from rulers of the upper level heavens, such as Mahabrahma and Maheshvara. He even went searching throughout the lands and the mountains, seeking a solution from spirits and various spiritual practitioners. But his search was all in vain. It was not until Chakra met with the Buddha and heard the Buddha's Dharma teachings that he was able to find a solution. It was this encounter with the Buddha and the Dharma that saved Chakra from his destiny as a pig in the next life. And instead, in his next life, he was born again in one of the heavenly realms. So the sutras recount that many gods from the various heavens also took refuge in the Buddha. The actual experience of Chakra is reflected in the lines searching everywhere for a place of refuge, searching tirelessly throughout the ten directions. Now, as for the aspect of objective analysis, the following section will praise the virtues of each gem separately to explain why the virtues and merits of the triple gem are most perfect and hence why the triple gem is the true place of refuge for all sentient beings. Oh. <coughs> 
<coughs> so I think time-wise, uh, maybe we should call it a day for now. Yes. <laughs> is that right? Time is... So this is a good place to, to stop um, for today and while before the storm's coming because I can see some really dark clouds. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, I have a three bows to the Buddha. I bow to the teacher. Thank you very Thank much. You everyone for your attention.